beautiful Waikiki on the island of Oahu is truly a beach lover's paradise. But Hawaii wasn't a beer lover's paradise until the first brew pub opened in the island of Oahu at Aloha Tower Marketplace. Gordon Biersch. Is that it? After the mash or? Uh, after our boil. After the boil? Yep, just knocked out into the whirlpool. It's 25 minutes to start cooling. And then that'll be the end. So who gets to shovel out the grain now? Uh, it's already done. Oh, it's done? It's already done. Okay, so you're doing the boil then? Yep, we just finished our boil. Now we're going to pour and then we knock out a 25 minute rest in the whirlpool. Which one are you making today? Uh, today's export. Export, okay. Second day of export. Twice to fill up the ferment. Uh, Whirlpool will burn you real good, so just avoid touching the bottom of that. Golly, I can do that. Have a good night. It's very deceptive. I didn't realize you were. Oh, it's, it's huge. What, this is. This is uh, definitely the biggest brewery in, uh, in Hawaii. Yeah. No, no feet, doubt about it. My feet feel tingly. <laughs> One of the biggest in uh, Gordon Beer's company. Now there's 12. Uh, different really? stores like really? this. But this is one of the bigger. We, we, we've been to Pasadena, San Francisco, the original ones. Yeah, Palo Alto. Uh, and there's Pal uh, Palo Alto. Palo Alto. Those three I've been to. Yeah. That's, that's like all there was. And then they opened this one. And then I don't, I couldn't find Up till last year, there were six. And then they did six more in a year. We can have the pictures when they brought in. The tunnel, sorry. There's always a lager tanks. Yep. So the big thing is to be pretty well set up. We get lucky to have six lager tanks. And then two fermenters. So it does give us eight tanks to brew and lager and let us get ahead on, which is how, the biggest. How big are these? These will, the fermenters will hold a good 60, 65 barrels. And then the lager tanks will do nice. about a 59 barrel lager tank. So we usually brew, Export and Meritson are about as full as we can brew. Uh, the other ones we taper a little bit according to need, but we can't keep Export and Meritson around for long. It takes about a month to go through about 60 barrels. So those are still your most popular beers? Still most popular. Uh, the Dumplis and the Blondbach are always right behind. Uh, and then the seasonal always goes real fast. The Blondbach is nice, but in this weather, that's a real dangerous it beer. Is, it is. I think that's why most people stick with the export. Yeah. And in this sort of weather, it's nice. It's not too sweet. It's not too heavy. It's a good beer just to drink a whole bunch of. And more and more, I see people who do a couple of the export and one of the Meritzen and then maybe one of the Duplass and then back to the export. So sure, it's, yeah. It's nice. A lot of people really, I think, appreciate the variety and the subtle taste they can get. Yeah, and it's nice that you do brew a variety and that you do offer a taste for people so that they can like pick you know which beer they want. And that's yeah. real classy. A lot of places don't do that anymore, but that's real yeah. nice. And it's nice, uh, I know just ourselves working in the restaurant, we tend just to drink the same thing over and over. So unless you really taste something else, 
you know, you kind of get yourself too narrow. So it's good that people like to taste it, and we really do try to have people taste it. You never know if you've never had a Meritzen or a Dunkless or a different style, that taste might be all you need to, to pick it up and go yeah. with it. So it's, it's always good. And hopefully this isn't, if you guys can smell, we have two actively fermenting beers going right now. And this will be our best beer. You can always get a good shot of the CO2 if you don't know. Well, congratulations for being the uh, first brew pub in Hawaii and, and one of the biggest and still going strong after all these years and it's really great to see. It's been five years now and five more and we'll look back again, I'm sure. All right, well, thank you very much for your time. Wish you My continued pleasure. success. My pleasure. Great to see you guys. My glass is empty, so yeah. the interview must be over, yeah. <laughs> And then the ship crashed into the giant glass of beer. Oh, the humanity. The albatross. Uh, <laughs> Classic German lagers are no accident at Gordon Biersch Brewery at Aloha Tower Marketplace. Hawaii's first modern microbrewery was Ali'i Brewing. Scott, how did you uh, get involved with Ali'i and brewing beer uh, commercially? Um, I started home brewing in '93. I bumped into a friend who was doing it at the time and uh, he turned me on to it and I was sold. I, I loved the flavor, I loved the taste, I loved being able to make my own and keep it around and watch it age and whatnot. <clears throat> and I stuck with it whereas the friends who taught me, his interest kind of waned a bit but I, I really enjoyed it so much that I just kept um, Brewing a couple batches a week. My library at home was full with about you know a hundred different um, batches I'd done. So I had bottles from the first batch all the way up to the most recent. I couldn't get enough really. And uh, about two years later, uh, about a year and a half later actually, I bumped into um, Frank Wenzel, the original owner of Ali. Actually, I bumped into a friend that was working here, and he introduced me to Frank. One thing led to another. Um, and I was graduating UH and I started out over here and <laughs> graduated, kind of just had a, this job waiting for me and then the company was purchased in uh, May of 96. Frank sold it and his partners then. New owners came in. They invested, the new owners invested a lot of money in the company so we went from a very primitive brewery to now a semi-primitive brewery. We still um, need a few things and could use some more advanced equipment but we are very small and so is our budget so I kind of approach making the beer as um, chefs I guess approach um, cooking I I kind of go with what my palate tells me I don't really follow recipes or well, only one recipe here actually had a base recipe um, the rest of them I've just winged them uh, they started in my kitchen then I used to use Oahu homebrew supplies um, little system they have over there to pilot um, some of the newer recipes which closer clo more closely mimicked um, what we do here rather than at home it's kind of too many variables at home but um, I just what I do is just start coming up with an idea and I'll put a recipe together see how it comes out adjust it accordingly to whatever my taste buds tell me I should do and then after that I'll go out and calculate all the science to the art, you know, then of course there's a science to the art, but from my background stuff, I approach it much more from the artistic side of things. I love our porter a lot. Um, I, you know, I like them all. I, I make them all for different, uh, I guess, occasions and for different types of beer drinkers, like the Golden Ale. I try to keep as light as I possibly can. It is a bit maltier than um, say your macro brew drinkers would probably appreciate, but I'm not going to go as low as to, you know, 
ruin the integrity of the of the craft brewing um, the thing, you know, yeah. to to make it so light that th it tastes like a macro brewed beer or something. I'd rather get that malty flavor in, in beer. So, I, but I I do make that real light to kind of you know the conversion beer from people who are, are scared of, of, of micro or craft brewed beer. Um, then our amber, that's you know that's our flagship beer. Um, that's the only recipe here that wasn't my original recipe. Um, yeah, you've got your uh, Palhana Porter available unfiltered at some locations. Yeah, um, I had it only unfiltered for um, a certain ale house in the back of Manoa. Um, but then our distributor ran out of the filtered product and the other accounts that had the porter on draft, um, I gave them the unfiltered porter and they were sold. So now I don't even, the only time I filter the porter is when we bottle it. And that's double filtered, um, once through a DE filter and then through a plate and frame filter, which uh, 0.45 micron um, filter pads we use. So it's basically a sterile beer filter. And uh, unfortunately, it, it takes out a lot of taste, body, flavor. Um, the two beers aren't even comparable side by side. They can come out of the same batch, but double filtered compared to the unfiltered. I think it's a totally different product. Um, Let's talk briefly about your other beers too, your, your stout and your mac nut. Well, the flavors. <laughs> the, uh, we make three flavored beers here. The mango wheat ale, which is along the lines of the golden as far as lightness goes. Um, it's kind of a seasonal uh, summer ale. Um, I don't know if I'll be able to stop making it after this summer. It's grown in popularity to the point where people are begging for it all year round. So we'll see if I, if, if there isn't that much demand, I'll probably stop. If there's a lot of demand, I think I'm gonna have to brew that all year round, which is tough because um, of our limited size here. There's, like I said, I like the variety thing, but it's also hard to produce when, you know, We've got our amber ale, which sells the most, and I have to make amber, amber, amber. I can't make enough of it, but then you have five other different products that take up the space that you could be using to put the amber in, as far as fermenters go. But uh, it's worth it just because of the variety. Like I said, I, I don't know if I could just make two beers and be happy, you know? The macadamia nut, um, same way. Uh, it has a more true, um, pronounced flavor to it. The macna definitely stands out more than the mango does. Um, but it still is, is not that strong where you can have another. Um, a lot of people like the, the macna a lot and they love to have it without the macadamia flavoring in there. They think it, it could do fine on its own. But the catchy name of the macadamia nut brown ale and just the fact that we are a Hawaiian microbrew and people um, think Hawaii, they think of things like macadamia nuts, so for what we do here, it, it kind of, it's nice. We're here at Hawaii's oldest microbrewery, Ali'i Brewing, which in Hawaiian means royalty, and we are drinking their flagship beer when they started with, oh, like six, seven years ago, and that would be Ali'i Amber. Of course, Scott Spicola, the current brewer, has tweaked the beer many times over the last few years, and it's no longer quite amber, it's a little bit lighter in body, but it still has that nice malt flavor and nice little spicy hop. Mm. And uh, they're also bringing a lot of other good beers here, so definitely look for those Elite beers. I'm drinking Elite Brewing's Hemp Ale. Mm. I think it has a high hop aroma. Quite an interesting flavor, never quite anything like it. Um, makes me really hungry actually, and makes me want to have um, a lot more of these, can't have just one. Sadly, Ali'i Brewing closed in 2001. Hawaii's first ale brewery comes from a famous Hawaiian name, Sam Choice. The 
Sam Choi is a very well-known chef, and he has his own cooking show in Hawaii, and uh, he has got quite a good reputation for uh, his uh, seafood. And uh, do you hope to uh, build the same reputation for your beer? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that's one thing that's, uh, that's real nice to be working for Sam, and as uh, I get a little bit of his spotlight, and in time, um, I mean, things for Sam right now are, are just booming. Uh, in time, as, as we work on our uh, beer marketing strategy, Sam will play a greater part in it. And uh, yeah, I, I would love to, uh, you know, team up with him and, and uh, you know, share some of his uh, spotlight. It's a good, great opportunity, you know, real good opportunity. Do you plan to do some uh, uh, food, beer pairings in the future? Yeah, we, we do some now, and we're working on a menu um, for our beer dinners where every course is not only paired with a beer, it's, it's made with a beer. Uh, we just recently came out with a uh, uh, Chiave Honey Porter Cheesecake, which is really good. Um, we're doing some, some beer sausages with Tony Spadaro. Uh, of course, we do the, the beer batter. We have dipping sauces made with certain beers. Um, right now, we're... Uh, we're doing steamed sh shellfish with our steam beer. Um, but yeah, that's, you know, like to get it to where we'll have two or three different beer menus where everything is made with one of the beers. You've got your uh, brewing kettles right there smack in the uh, restaurant. And uh, do you find it hard to uh, fit in your brewing schedule and accommodate the uh, patrons as well? I'll tell you, it, it, we, we start brewing very early in the morning, um, but we open for business very early in the morning, too. We open for uh, breakfast, yeah. Yeah, open for breakfast at 6.30, so it's, uh, it, at times it's, it's a little hectic. We try to get most of the heavy work done before the lunch crowd gets there because it just gets packed at lunchtime. Um, and it puts a little more stress on, on myself and my assistant because, uh, you know, with with one valve that, that gets, uh, you know, bumped open, or if we take a hose off and the valve's not entirely shut, uh, we just bought a bunch of people their, uh, their, their meals, you know. So if you want to see some beer being made, you should go there for breakfast or, or for Absolutely. brunch? Absolutely. Uh, we're, you know, the, well, what really gets people's attention is when we, uh, when we pull the grain out of the mash tun and, uh, you know, that's everybody stops you and looks up and what's that? You know, can I eat that? What do you, what do you do with? Uh, as far as that, you know, they're, they're just looking at a couple guys hooking hoses up and standing over uh, steaming vats. I mean, I'm pleased that we do five beers and uh, they move in a pretty tight cluster. It's, you know, no one beer is, is the runaway. Um, and I credit most of that to the paddle because based on the beer descriptions, uh, a lot of people, Hawaii especially, people will tend to pick the lightest, uh, safest beer. But by ordering a uh, sampler, they're able to uh, try all five beers. And, you know, more often than not, people uh, will really love a beer that they tell me they would never have ordered based on the description or by its look. You know, they see something with a little color in it, and uh, yeah, no way. They, you know, they're, they're running for what looks closest to uh, Coors Light, Bud Light, but uh, they're pleasantly surprised. Glenn, Glenn, you are serving this man his beer at his 500th brewery. Oh, yeah. I told you about that, yeah? yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, good. I like it better if you ordered now, beer. We celebrated Jeff's 500th brewery by partaking in Sam Choi's famous Brewer's Dinner, combining Sam's cuisine with Dave Campbell's fine beers. Toasted bread, a very uh, delicate, nice uh, appetizer to stimulate the appetite, and the beer to stimulate the thirst. Cream ale. Not only does 
Sam Choi provide great food at uh, these brewery dinners, but they also color coordinate their food, as you can see. And uh, this is uh, seared ahi, slightly spicy, and a little wasabi in that sauce, and ahu ale a slightly bitter pale ale, or copper ale actually, to go with this wonderful ahi. We have a nice spicy chicken satay, a kebab, something I know about, and a beer, something I also know about. A steam ship beer in the Northern California tradition. Plenty of hops to go with plenty of spice. time is the Jamaican jerk chicken and it has a lot of nice some spices associated with whipped beers quite often, nutmeg perhaps allspice, which is perhaps why the, uh, the Weiss beer here at Healthy Bites is a good pairing, classic Weiss beer flavor, a spicy beer, yeasty to go with our spicy food. Sam Choi's Brewers Dinner with that traditional Hawaiian favorite, Brownie Alamo, and a new Hawaiian favorite, Honey Porter with locally produced honey, mm. got a nice dry, chocolatey, roasty aroma, a deep rich flavor and for smoothness, I'm going to trip to the honey, very good beer to go with uh, dessert, cheers. The Brewer's Dinner is held once a month at Sam Choi's Breakfast, Lunch, and Crab and Beer. Honolulu's newest brew pub is Brew Moon at Ward Center. We have a, a, an American style wheat ale with fruit, um, a pale ale, and an English um, amber ale. Um, and then we have um, a light beer in the Hellas style, and also a Pilsner. And uh, then our, quite often my specials are lagers because I have to balance out my, the use of my yeast. It's in a brewery this small where we don't brew you know, a lot, not a production brewery, everything revolves on the yeast and the health of the yeast and that determines what I can brew when and if I can bring in a third strain, like I've brought in a Belgian strain and an alt strain and a Kolsch strain, um, uh, other English ale strains that I've done some specialties with and I plan to, you know, keep uh, bringing in uh, other strains to give people a variety of beers that they can, um, they can try or experience. You know, we always have the five standard beers on that, that aren't, they're, they're not going to change because uh, I, I think they're just too popular. Like they all sell pretty much equally. Nothing is really selling more than anything else. Uh, but we're all, we have, now have three um, Brewmaster Special Taps so that I can bring in a, a larger variety of specials and have them keep rotating uh, throughout the year. You know, I don't know, the black hole, when it's on the sampler, uh, and people know it's here, it goes, it goes pretty quick. And the stout is more of a, a specific crowd, but or, or, tailored to a specific crowd, but it's uh, you know, really popular, but a lot of people will shy away from a stout just because they believe that stouts are heavy. Although I don't believe this stout is particularly heavy, uh, but it has you know, really nice roast character to it. Um, but I think the stout drinkers really appreciate it and often say, you know, it compares to Guinness or uh, they like it as just as much as a uh, commercial style of uh, stout. Um, when I was out in Japan, uh, I got to meet um, several of the people involved with the Kostritzer Brewery in uh, Germany. And I guess I'd never really had a good black beer until that, that point, and then that really turned me on to that style of beer. 
Uh, and now I, so I uh, came back and tried to emulate uh, their beer. I, I don't think I've quite achieved exactly what they have, uh, but I, nonetheless, I do like the black hole and, um, and its characteristics. It's on the lighter side of dark beers, and a lot of people who say they never drink a dark beer often say, hey, you know, this is a real reasonable beer, and I would consider, you know, having it again. Uh, the biggest challenge for me is the two-story aspect to the brewery, uh, where the brew house is below us on the, on the ground floor and the fermentation is on the second floor, which is the same level as the restaurant. Uh, and it, normally I would be able to run a brewery completely by myself. Uh, in this instance, I need a partner uh, or an assistant to be downstairs or upstairs when I'm the opposite. Uh, to coordinate valves and temperatures and aeration and whatnot. Um, that's, and then the communication aspect is difficult with that. But we have a phone downstairs and upstairs that we can talk on, uh, but you know, the phone's attached to the wall and you'd have to leave what you're doing in order to come and answer it. So that's th the two-story aspect uh, for communication and for transferring is, um, and convenience. Is uh, is hard, but uh, you know if you do, when you drive into Ward Center, it's this thing sticks out at you, and you can see it. So let's hope that that draws people into the restaurant uh, to drink the beer. Well, I hope it's because I'm making uh, clean beers in style, uh, and that's all I can try to make every time is you know keep down the diacetyl and the dimethyl sulfate and and the acetaldehyde and, and other things like that, which I pay a lot of attention to, to not have in my beers, especially when it's not uh, demanded in that style. Um, so, it, so, the, so the beers are, the, the beers are clean and, and you know, keep within the right original gravities and, and the right finishing gravities and the right hop levels. Uh, and I use um, you know, classic hops for the style. I'm not going, I'm not trying to create new styles. Uh, or hybrids, I'm, you know, staying within the classic realms of uh, each beer style. I promise I won't use this if Jeff doesn't nail the hop, okay? Well, you know it's American, so yeah. that count nails the job. I have two guesses. The first one is Centennial. Centennial. And he got the hop. <sighs> like there was everybody down, I'm just that that modest. I'm drinking Mocha Java Porter. Interesting aroma. I honestly they don't get much Mocha Java from it. Enough dark, malty taste. I don't get coffee. I don't like mocha. I don't get java. What I like, would like to talk about is their Great Pacific Ale, and I pegged it right away. Brewed with all Centennial hops. Perhaps one of my most favorite hops. My most favorite hop in the United States. A wonderful cascady type of hop aroma. Really bitter taste. A dry, bitter finish. A wonderful American pale ale. I like it. This is pretty good too. Today's episode of Beer Track has been brought to you by the R. E. W. E is upside down, Chris. The four main ingredients of beer. Although Brew Moon recently changed owners, you can always count on a Brew Moon over Hawaii. Mahalo to all the Hawaii breweries for making Hawaii truly paradise. Aloha!